Welcome back to the show. We're about to learn the secret sauce. Cool. Yeah. So Jason, thanks so much for the time. And uh, do you want to enter yourself to the audience, who you are, how you got here? Sure. So these days I'm hacking on Replay.io, which is new time travel enabled dev tools. But before Replay, I was tech lead for the Firefox debugger on dev tools. Okay. I've heard of that. <laughs> yeah. That's a, it, w what year did you leave uh, Firefox? I started Replay back in 2020. 2020. So that's when, was it around the layoffs? Did you get layoff? So it's like a weird question that I'm asking you. No, sensitive no, no, no. subject. Yeah. I have a history with layoffs. Yeah. I left Etsy two weeks before layoff. Okay. And I happened to leave Mozilla about a month before the layoff. Okay. So this, yeah. 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 I, I, I've left GitHub six months before the layoffs. <laughs> there you go. A couple of weeks before the reorgs though. Mm. Um, but that's neat to hear there. Um, so like what's your, your background? How'd you get the, the Mozilla? Sure. So it all starts with Recurse Center, which at the time in 2012 was a thing called Hacker School. Yes. And you could just work on whatever you want to work on. So I went in with this idea that I was going to understand Ruby on Rails, which was like the hotness. Yeah. Because I oh, love building. Yeah. But yeah. when Rails didn't work, you were stuck. It was yeah. like a wizard without a wand. You're like, why can't I do the thing I want to do? And two weeks into Recurse, and this is like the beautiful thing about Recurse, a buddy of mine was working on the Ruby REPL. And he was like, I know you like Ruby on Rails. Have you looked at this thing called Pry and how you can inspect it? And I'm hacking on it. You want to hack on it with me? Yeah. And I was just hooked. Wait, was that the, the, the creator of Pry? Or no, this is somebody just who another, just wanted to mess with it? Yeah. Just another person who was messing with it. Okay. And I never imagined that a Ruby developer could work on Ruby dev tools and it was written in Ruby. Yeah. I just felt like you had to be a magician who was hacking on C with Mots and the whole like Japanese crew. Yeah. And there was a community there too. So Pry had five or six core contributors. They were amazing. They were working on it all the time. So I could begin attending calls, getting to know them, joining the, it wasn't Discord at the time. I think it was like IRC um, or Gitter yeah, or something. What was the, the, uh, it wasn't Slack, but there was also this other one. Yeah. But there was a lot of IRC as well. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like so long ago. <laughs> it was this like web 2.0 thing. Like it yeah. wasn't quite IRC, but like they hadn't graduated to Slack yet. But yeah. they're all there. Hip chat. Yeah, Sorry, like that kind me. of thing. Yeah. And getting to know the team felt like the big unlock. Because open source to me at that point was something inaccessible. Okay. And then I was like hacking on Pry, working on debugging tools. And I felt like I could look at Rails in a new way too. Like if I was ever stuck with Rails, I could go in and figure it out and then move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing too as well. And the, literally what we're trying to do to open source is like really demystify the people behind the yeah. code yeah. and like have a story where you could connect with them and collaborate with them. And if they want collaboration, they can attract more collaborators. And uh, I think where you have that, you'd mentioned with Matt's and the folks in Japan who are working on Ruby there's like a whole ocean between us. So yeah. like, unless you knew somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody, or you happen to be in the right GitHub repo yeah. with the right issues, yeah, you don't know how accessible it is, yeah. which is wild. So uh, Anjana was a previous guest. Uh, mm. She actually went through the Reef Curse Center as well. Uh, did you actually go out to New York? Or what, I are was you from the, New York? I was, I was in New York at the time. Yeah. They were based out of Etsy. Oh. So like this Etsy connection. I didn't even know that. Just, just for one or two batches because the batch after me they left the room was vacated etsy expanded hired a bunch of recursors and i got my desk back oh wow i just stayed where i was but that etsy connection with recurse which withdraw drew me to etsy as well wow how is etsy doing it's still a th it's still a thing i mean i'm pretty sure I've, my wife has bought stuff from there recently yeah it's doing well i think they kind of lost their way with going public it's yeah. difficult when you have to grow up and present yourself in a new way. Yeah. But they figured it out, and I think they've kept that culture, which was always special. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So uh, you worked at Etsy. What did you do at Etsy? So I joined the seller experience team, which was really small because most people focus on the buyer experience of the marketplace. Yeah. But the seller experience, you had all these amazing female entrepreneurs 
kind of like left the boring corporate job to do something really artistic. And we got to serve them. And they needed really advanced selling tools, which at the time meant we can't do it in PHP. Yeah. We shouldn't do it in jQuery. But there's this thing called Backbone JS. <laughs> and it could be kind of cool. Yeah. So we started building these really advanced selling tools in Backbone and actually a framework called Marionette. I remember Marionette. And I got more involved with that team, became a core contributor, which wasn't about the code. It was about those four people who I really liked. Yeah. And working with them and then started building out the Marionette dev tools. Wow. You're like, you like bleed open source. Like, I like, you, I like, you the, totally get it. Yeah. I like the people. Yeah. Like that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I was actually just talking to Mishko uh, about his sort of state of the union of wh why he built Angular and like mm. Backbone and all these other frameworks were kind of there. And then he ended up building Angular. Completely sidestep of this conversation. But yeah. folks, check out that other podcast, which will hopefully de deploy probably before or after this one. It felt like physics before Newton. Yeah. There are so many different ideas, but like none of them were right. Yeah. We were missing something. But that's the cool thing about open source. You kind of, you kind of just throw your ideas out there and see who kind of gloms onto them and yeah. build together or build in silos and come back to us when you're ready to share. Like it's an amazing opportunity experience, but also that sort of, um, what we called it at, at, at GitHub was the human dependency graph. Yeah. And like that understanding that you're you're working on this problem, but it's like this problem eventually has another dependency, which is this person who's using it. Yeah. And then that person is using it. And then now you all get to work together or yeah. separate and solve similar problems. And it has to be entrepreneurial. Yeah. Can I go off there and I build your own thing and don't talk to anybody? Yeah. It doesn't work. But it's when you're talking to different projects and, and not projects, but people, you're like, hey, you've got that special thing. Can we make that integration better? Yeah. And hey, you can use this thing in that way. That's when it really clicks. Yeah. So eventually, Backbone was like, a, well, I think it still is a thing, to be quite honest. But yeah, people have moved on and, yeah. and you eventually moved on from that. So like, what was that transition in which you sort of land? So I remember seeing Dan Abramov's Redux dev tools talk of oh, the time travel debugging yeah yes i remember this because i was about to give the marionette dev tools pitch at backbone conf v3 which is like the final backbone conf and i saw it i was like oh shit <laughs> we're doing this all wrong just scrap jquery scrap backbone we need to go towards something that is declarative and at the time i had invested all this effort into understanding browser dev tools. So the Backbone and Marionette dev tools were another panel inside of browser dev tools. Yeah. We had some APIs, but not great ones. Like we were building the component tree, but like it really should just be in like the elements panel. We we're building our version of like the call stack, but that should be in the debugger. We had a profile view, which was pretty cool for seeing where things were slow, but like that should be in the performance tab. And I realized that dev tools, whether it was Chrome or Firefox, were open source. They were written in HTML, JavaScript, CSS. You could hack on them as a web developer and make them better. So that was the transition for me. There was six months of, holy shit, I can contribute as an open source developer to Firefox or to Chrome. I want to do this. Realizing that the Chrome DevTools team was in Russia, like literally oh, St. Petersburg. I didn't know that. Yeah. At some point, they, many of them moved to Mountain View. Many of them chose not to move to Mountain View and, and left Google. But there was like a decision for them. But for me at the time, I wasn't going to move to Russia. That was a non-starter. And there was this Firefox team that had two openings. And I had the chance to work with a team that was open source. So people knew that core team. And because they were second, like clearly people were using Chrome and not Firefox at that point. Yeah. There was an opportunity to do some really crazy stuff. So they pitched me on devtools.html which is a ground up rewrite of DevTools in React. I was like, yeah, let's go. Wow. That's amazing. What year was this? That was 2016. 2016. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And I remember like, was that uh, before or after the sort of Rust rewrite where they had this sort of compiler that they embedded in there? I don't know if, okay, Rust existed. Yeah. But it was not a big thing for browser devs. It was like off to the side. Yeah. Okay. And then I, 
it's like it's crazy because I was just talking to um, actually Mike from Fermion. Yeah. And he, uh, he was talking through this whole WebAssembly trajectory yeah. and how it was like, oh, we thought it was going to be here, but now we're over here. Yeah. And it's thriving. And folks who know, they know. And eventually everyone will know. But yeah, it seemed like Mozilla, like at that time, was like they were just trying a bunch of stuff. And yeah. maybe because they were just at a position where, you know, when you're second best, you always have something to, sh to strive for. And they were just like rolling the dice on all these different technologies. So what happened for them was Firefox OS. Okay. Like, go back enough, and you got Firebug yeah. in 2006. Yeah. Killed it, right? Like, you didn't, you had document.write <laughs> before you had Firebug. Firebug brought the console, the elements panel to the world. Yeah. You go forward in time to 2009, folks are primarily using Firefox if you're a developer. Like, that's where DevTools lived. Yes. Chrome had just forked WebKit, and they're like, we could do better than Safari. But then you go forward in time to like 2012 and Firefox bets on the phone. And they're like, there's Android, there's iOS, but we could do a web first OS. Let's just go all in. Let's like bet the farm. I joined Mozilla early 2016, like two months after they officially killed Firefox OS. And there was so much scar tissue. They're like, oh God, that hurt. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that. And actually, I know folks who were on that team. Yeah. Uh, I, I got invited to a dinner. Uh, you actually, you know D's? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so yeah. I was at a, a D's dinner, which yeah. is like a, apparently a thing. Yeah. And uh, it was a bunch of ex-Firefox OS yeah. team. And it was fascinating to hear those stories because I vaguely remember it. It wasn't like a thing that, I mean, it's not as, it doesn't exist anymore. I, I got an iPhone instead. Yeah. And um, But it was like, interesting to, to understand that, okay, that failed. Uh, you joined now when they have to figure out whatever the next thing yeah. is and they convince you dev tools. And I think I was actually, I consistently installed Firefox for years as yeah. my, my dev browser. Oh, sure. Uh, it was like, oh, we got to test it out to see if it works differently in other browsers. So I'd have yeah. all the browsers installed. So like at that time you were building this debugger, like what was that experience being on the team? Like the, like, it was especially coming out of the the sort of scar tissue of Firefox OS. Like, was that did that affect the work that you were doing? Oh, it had to. Yeah. So, Dev Tools at Mozilla was the A team. <laughs> there were so many talented people, but between 2012 and 2015, everyone was on the OS project. Yeah. So you're just pulling everyone into that. You just had to. But coming back, all of a sudden. Like Lynn Clark, who went on to like WebAssembly fame, yep. she was on DevTools. Uh, James Long, of course. Oh, yeah. Was, I didn't know James was that. Was Firefox debugger. So I got to work with him and nobody knew React better than him. Yeah. And they're just all these brilliant people. Yeah, amazing. So you, you spent up until 2020 working on this this feature, this experience, basically. I don't know if you call it just a feature, but the experience which was pretty great. We started the new debugger in its own repo with like an HTML page. Yeah. Like script tag, react, and then like app. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Wow. Amazing. So yeah, what I, I guess my question is like that experience working at open source, building this, this debugger in mm. react, like how was it interacting with the community? Cause like, how does Firefox even maintain open source? So every team's different. Mozilla is classically chaotic. Brilliant people just doing whatever they want to do. We got to just like do whatever we want to do on the debugger because like that was our space. Yeah. But then there was also order where like the top was coming in like, eh, maybe you should do more of this and some roadmap-y stuff, but mostly chaos. And then on the open source side, you're always understaffed. So yeah. it was small to try to do a new debugger in six months, a year with just James and I. But then at some point, James left because yeah. he had been doing it for five years and he had been through the slog. Yeah. And then it was just me and there was no shot. There was no way this thing was going to ship if we didn't begin recruiting open source developers. So at the time, we had the first Mozilla project where you can just like git clone, npm install, npm start and start working on a dev tool. Everything required like building the browser, but we were separate. And then we just leaned on that and went from having like three or four steady contributors to like hundreds. By the time I left, we had brought 400 people through 
who had all made con uh, contributions. Wow. And these are outside non-Mozilla employees. No. Yeah. And actually, when new people would come in, they were often guessing who was on the team and who wasn't and wrong. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, were they wrong because it was only just you at that point? Well, other dev tools employees were coming in too, but just like contributing on the side. So Got it. Like, that person clearly isn't on the team, but they were. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing too as well. But also, I guess chaos the the the, the chaos makes a lot of sense as far as Mozilla because yeah. I've never contributed anything to any sort of Mozilla project, but uh, it just seemed like it was like a lot of people coming and going and, and, and leaving and working on some side projects, and then some things would take off. So, how does Mo Mozilla make money? So Mozilla's always had a browser that hundreds of millions of people use. Yeah, and in the URL bar. You've always been on search, and there's always been a default search provider. Yeah. So that kind of bankrolls the Got company <laughs> on the tune of like three hundred to four hundred million dollars a year. Wow. And that's both a both a blessing and a curse. Yeah. Like you've got that stable source of income. You don't have to worry too much about things like paychecks, payroll, but any other thing has to stack up against that three hundred yeah. million dollars sure bet. Yeah. So it's really hard in this like chaotic environment for anything to take off and do better than that like cash cow. Yeah, that makes so much sense too as well. Cause I remember like being an early Mozilla user when it came out and like, this is the exciting thing. I was, I might've still been in high school or maybe just started college. I don't actually, don't quite remember when it actually shipped as the, the browser, Yeah, but it was way before Chrome. Yeah. No, yeah, it was way before. It was definitely high school. Cause I remember Chrome was when I was in college. Sure. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm gonna, I already have a Gmail account. I guess I'll just sign into this thing. Yeah. Um, absolutely amazing. So like Chrome, Firefox, Mozilla, like they they have the cash cow. So that's yeah. like, kind of makes sense. And like what Mozilla is still doing, like how are they still around? Um, but I guess there's a lot of money in the, who's the default provider today? Oh, Google. Google still. But yeah. it also depends on country. You got so it. I believe in Asia, there are different uh, defaults as uh, well. That makes sense. Yeah. And these are five-year contracts that you can renew. So you're not worried about like the next six months. Yeah, that's an interesting business model. My my wheels are turning. Yeah. So yeah. you you since you you left uh, on your own will uh, back in 2020 to build Replay, and I remember the the buzz around Replay when you yeah. eventually emerged and say, "Hey, I've got a thing," because I remember the Dan Abramoff conversation, or yeah. the, sorry, the not the conversation, but the uh, the pitch or the the talk. Yeah. And I remember that being a thing that a lot of people had attempted. Yeah, uh, that time travel, you know, record interactions in the browser, which you gave a quick intro to Replay. Could, yeah. Like, could you just expand on what Replay is? Yeah. So we should probably start with what is time travel? Yeah. Because that's used a <laughs> lot. Okay. That's a, that's a longer podcast. <laughs> time travel debugging. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one of those things like blockchain or CRDT that's been around for a while. And in fact, people have been trying to record and re-execute their software deterministically since like the beginning of computers. So yeah. there's tons and tons of literature. And in the functional circles, like the Haskells of the world, people have been fairly successful. But it's been limited to like toys, PhD projects, and like functional environments. Yeah. I never assumed it'd be possible to time travel in something like the browser. Yeah. And that's where Mozilla comes in. So Mozilla is this chaotic environment with brilliant hackers and it's very much like David V. Goliath. And if there's one of me to 10 Chrome developers, how am I going to keep up? And back in 2010, they were able to build the first time travel debugger for C++. Wow. And this thing was just good enough so that you can record some aspect of the browser, like the render engine or the JavaScript engine. And once you've captured it, you can re-execute it in GDB. Yeah. Pause at a breakpoint, step forward or step backwards, resume to the next breakpoint or rewind to the prior. And as soon as that happened, then the question was, if this thing is making it possible for us to work on the browser, what can we do within the browser to take debugging to the next level as well? Yeah. Okay. So we got the time travel thing. Yeah. Uh, and apparently, I, I didn't know about the time travel in, the, in Firefox. What was the what was the reason you left Mozilla? Like, did you did you see this? Okay, this is a thing I want to work on. I'm gonna go work on this. So, why did I go to Mozilla? Yeah. I went to Mozilla to work on debugging. Yeah, 
I had had this experience at Recurse where it's like, oh my God, I can work on Pry. And if I can use Pry to understand my Ruby apps, like I'm good. And I went to Etsy and I was kind of like the Chrome DevTools guy. If someone was stuck, I'd like go over to their desk and I, I wouldn't necessarily know what was going on in their app, but I could show them how to use breakpoints and call stacks and just kind of, we'd figure it out. Yeah. And I had this hunch that if I was working on the debugger, I can make it easier to use. And then other people would have that intuition as well. It was like a UX problem. Yeah. Two years in, I realized there was nothing we could do to make breakpoints <laughs> better. Yeah. We were going to lose to print statements every time. Yeah. I mean, still my number one grab for, for printing or figuring out what's going on. Yeah. It's everyone's. And even if you made breakpoints better, there is no way to do collaboration. Like whether you're doing breakpoints or print statements, you're still running the application on your computer in your browser and looking at dev tools. And someone else has to like zoom in and like look at your screen. Yeah. Or vice versa. There's no way to have this shared canvas. Yeah. That that makes so much sense too as well. And like I think even in 2020 or even now with the remote Everything, I imagine replay, you don't have an office. Yeah. Like everyone's remote. Yeah. There's no walking to the desk anymore. Yeah. And uh, more and more, like GitHub is shutting down their office at the end of the year. Yeah. So there's no wow. more There's no more walking to the desk. Yeah. I no longer have this crutch of like, here's my laptop. It yeah. has the bug. I've reproed it. You can see it. Yeah. Now, like if I hand you my laptop with the bug in the tab, you have to be really careful because if you refresh <laughs> or do anything, yes. it's gone. Yeah. It never happened. Yeah. And that's where we come in. So you can forget about all the time travel features. We got tons of crazy stuff. But at the simplest level, I can open up the replay browser, click record, capture the bug. It's now in the time capsule. Share the replay with you as a URL. You can open it. And you now have something similar to Chrome DevTools to inspect it. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, we have we currently have an issue open because uh, we don't have a debugger in production or yeah. even like a sentry or a bug snag. Yeah. And uh, we're now evaluating these these tools. So I didn't I didn't even mention it to you uh, prior to jumping here, but yeah. that experience is like we that's this is the issue we have right now. Tell me about the bug. Yeah, I, I honestly I don't remember what the bug was, but we do have like where where data basically is just not presenting on the dashboard. Yeah. It's like, hey, it's like this is a situation. Who found it? Um, I think me. I was actually doing yeah. a, a demo for Techstars. Yeah. And uh, I was just walking through like, hey this data doesn't work anymore. Here's a screenshot. Yeah. Here's a screenshot. Everyone gets a screenshot. Yeah. But to try to re reproduce that, it's not too hard to reproduce it in someone else's machine because our, our app's not that complicated. Sure. But we will get to the point where you have a custom dashboard and this yeah. is how it, you interact with it. And these are the people who interact with your dashboard. Yeah. Well, we'll have data issues like we always will. And even though we use TypeScript, like we'll sure. also have issues down the road. Uh, but it's just being able to have an experience. Uh, we also have a ton of people. The other half of this, we have a ton of people who use like Linux machines. Yeah. Um, like in India and Nigeria who are a part of our open source contributors. Sure. And they just have weird install. Like, All the time. Yeah. And yeah. It's at the, it's a, the thing where I have like, I've got the brand new M1. Well, it's not even brand new anymore. Now it's the old one. But it works on my machine always. Yeah. Because <laughs> I just happen to have the best that I had at the time last year. Um, but when you start working with folks who are like interesting situations and this is my network speed, like it's slow enough that we can catch weird bugs and yeah. that we're expected that this would actually load first. Uh, it's so we, the inverse of the browser test problem. Yeah. Like the test runs so fast that you find all of these timing issues. Yeah. But if you go overseas and you're far from US Eats 2, yes. you see all of those timing issues converted yeah well, actually so the one issue we actually had is the when you log in we cache your jwt and say okay yeah. you're logged in yeah this is your data so the simple one of uh you know, like we fixed this since but yeah listing all your prs that you've done yeah anybody can see them on open sauce but we don't know if you're you so we sure. present it differently but if you're in a slower environment like it hasn't cached yet after you've logged in but we're presenting data because it's already on the database it's a timing issue yeah so that was that was also that was very interesting um because i had actually caught that one yeah. as well and other people over i thought i was crazy <laughs> so i was like maybe it's like oh it's, it's like I need a hard refresh or something yeah uh it turns out that wasn't it was a real bug but it's just one of those situations like if 
if I'm just going through and trying to create a demo because I've got a, a call with a customer coming up and then I'm like, oh man, this is not working. Now I have to do like weird demos, seek like hand waving demo stuff to make it work. Sure. But I want to also record that bug. Yeah. Like that's a perfect situation to be had that. And I'm also a person who I don't know the Chrome dev tools as much as I could because, sure. you know, I'm not going to, it's I, really, I used to go to the conferences and watch everything. But it's now two it's different like, flows. Yeah. Like in flow number one, you're prepping for that demo. Something weird happens. You just want to click save. Yeah. And have the last minute. Yes. And then you want to be able to share that, like create a linear ticket or a Jira ticket. Like here's the URL. Yes. You've got everything you need. I've also added some comments in there so you could see like that looks bad, that looks bad, that looks bad. And then a dev can just open it up and they've got dev tools and they can inspect the React components. They can add print statements and replay. So I yeah. learned that like better breakpoints is not the answer. We want to give people the ability to find a React component, add a print statement, and then log all of the calls. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the, uh, why build a whole other browser for replay? So that kind of gets at the existential question yeah. of how do you record in the first place? Yes. What are you recording? And the short answer is people have tried to do this in JavaScript with like Babel and proxies and stubbing network requests, capturing user interactions. That kind of looks at some point like you're writing a Cypress test or a playwright test. Yeah. We're going to capture just the things we need to replay them later and like click, 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 and the API calls are stubbed. That doesn't work. You can try. It's not going to work. The next layer down is you do instrumentation in the JS engine. And you're like a browser hacker, and every call into the JS engine is captured. That's like recording the heart, but you missed all the other organs of the browser. Okay. That also doesn't work, and it's really hard. The place that we sit as a browser is in between the browser code and the OS. So if you think of like the browser sitting on top of like the Mac OS or Windows or Linux, it's constantly making libc calls, constantly making system calls to the computer to like read a file, open a file, uh, allocate memory, open a socket, get a font, rasterize the font. All of that stuff is what we capture. Got it. And you do that. And then later when someone goes to view the replay, we spin up a Docker container on our backend, download that version of the browser that was used to make the recording. And we say, go. And it thinks it's running on your computer. It thinks it's yesterday. It thinks it's talking to the internet. It thinks you're like clicking. It's totally in the matrix. Yeah. Ah, that's so cool. Yeah. And the replay is also open source as well. Yeah. Okay. How do you how do you interact between the common question I, I ask everyone who has an open source sure. company is like how do you interact between customers and contributors? Sure. So the nice thing about working at a dev tool is a lot of your users are developers. Not all developers, because a lot of people are using replay as a recorder. Yeah. But for people who live in replay dev tools and spend two hours debugging a day, you're going to see things that are slightly off. You're like, man, I wish autocomplete were a little bit better. I wish I could search in slightly a better way. And then you can contribute it to dev tools. Yeah. And we have Brian Vaughn on the team who built React dev tools, Mark Erickson, who's the lead contributor or lead yeah. maintainer of Redux is on the team. So working on dev tools is an opportunity to work with those amazing developers as well. Yeah, that was a good get, good get to as well when Brian uh, left the React core team, which it seems to have a, a bit of an exodus happening right now. Um, shout out to Vercel, <laughs> who's hiring a few of those folks. It's current current banter right now on Twitter. But yeah, that's, a, that's amazing to get. You're basically rebuilding what you had at Mozilla with like yeah. the, the smartest people yeah. working on the hardest problems. And uh, I'm super excited about like trying out Replay again because uh, I was actually early user... Um, back in the day but we didn't have enough sure enough sure. bugs to really start tracking but now we do we, yeah. we've got them for sure and the second part of the thesis is we could build the best react debugging yeah. so it kind of goes back to the backbone of marionette days of like would it be better if the elements panel knew about your framework and the call stack knew about your framework we have an opportunity with replay dev tools to make replay dev tools v2 react dev tools the next generation yeah and just design it for those people in mind yeah, I love that. And it's been a while since I React DevTools still support, still maintain. Uh, oh sure. By, by I guess contributors and meta and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but if thought? you're Brian, oh, yeah, there's only so far you could take React DevTools. Yes. Just like it was only so far that I could take the Firefox debugger, 
at some point, everything you want to build requires something with time travel. Yeah. Like time travel is the missing piece for all of that functionality. Yeah. So how does it, like, do you see replay going beyond just the browser? Like if I'm going to do time traveling, yeah. like I've got server issues yeah. as well. Like how do I, Yeah. I could record it today, but like what's, what's, the, what's next for replay? Yeah. So let's say you're focusing on React debugging. Yeah. In 2018, you got spots. You got, you know, create React app. You got Next.js. In 2023, React is going full stack. Yes. You kind of want to record the initial renders, the hydration uh, stuff on the client, yeah. and then all the client renders. Yes. And all the API calls are going to some JavaScript edge function somewhere. The beautiful thing about React going full stack and JavaScript going full stack yes. is we have an opportunity to build full stack JavaScript dev tools. Oh, yeah. You know, honestly, uh, well, <laughs> you're, you're running a company to be paying attention to this, but now I'm like, okay, yeah. I get it now. Yeah. And uh, it makes a lot of sense, especially with the what, server components that are coming out. You've got TRPC as well that's kind of trying to own Amazing. the full stack experience. Yeah. Uh, but there's also a ton of other stuff that's like uh, you mentioned edge functions. I wonder if can you also can you test on the edge then like, with with the in, with replay as well? So the way I think about it, we've got Firefox, Chrome, Safari. Yeah. That's on the client. But on the back end, you have Vercel, AWS Lambdas, Cloudflare Workers, Bun, Dino. The amazing thing about the back end is you can drop our recorder for Node into any of those platforms and start recording by default. So one recording of your app might include a recording for the browser where you're actually clicking around yeah. and several recordings for the server-side renders, all those API calls as well. Okay. Yeah. This, uh, the future is bright. Yeah. yeah. This, the, the evolution of what's, what we're seeing right now, but we're also... We're, yeah, there's so much more happening too as well besides the, the React server stuff. Um, I, I was actually just talking, because you mentioned the Recurse Center. Like, I know yeah. the Zig founder sure. also went to Recurse. And now we have these new runtimes things to, to bun as well that are also you know, just changing up the game a bit. And yeah. I think having the sort of full stack dev tool to debug your dev tools, um, this is exciting. So this is the first time, I, I haven't checked this, but I think this is true. I think this is the first time there have been more developers working on JavaScript outside of the browsers yeah. than inside. Oh, like yeah. if you go back five years, you had all the browser engineers, sure. Chrome has maybe 20, Firefox had maybe 10. You can like add it up. Actually, Apple had like four people working on JavaScript. It's so like in total, you had like 30 people. Yeah. And then you had Netflix, uh, Facebook, and um, I always forget the third one, uh, Bloomberg, working on JavaScript engines. But now, with all of these other uh, Buns and Dinos and Cloud Flares of the world, you have a lot more JavaScript engineer hackers outside the browser than inside. And none of them have dev tools. Bun doesn't have a dev tool. For sales, debugging story is non-existent. Here's some logs. That's all you've got. It feels like we're going back to the firebug days. Yeah. Where all you, all you can do is like print to some file somewhere and there's an opportunity to provide a unified cloud first dev tool debugging story. Very cool. Well, I'm, I'm super excited about this and uh, I'm going to wind down the conversation. But yeah, anything else you want to share about the future of Replay, open source? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, for me, it's all open source. I wouldn't have been able to get started if Pry wasn't such a great community to get involved with. Yeah. And I hope we can do the same thing for the next gener generation of people who are working on DevTools. So at a high level, if you want to get involved, you can join our community and work on Replay DevTools. We'd love to have you. But one step further, we also have this incredible protocol that we're building DevTools with. And for me, what keeps me up at night, because I'm so excited about this, is the kinds of debugging UIs that have been possible before that are now relatively easy to build. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks for coming out and uh, having the conversation with me, Jason. Uh, hopefully, folks, try out Replay. Uh, definitely, it's open source. So definitely check out the repo, uh, the repo, the Replay repo. That was a 
<laughs> I don't know why that was such a tongue twister, but the replay repo, uh, check that out and uh, stay saucy. Stay saucy.